Good morning. Welcome. So nice to see you all here. Welcome to our online community as well. It is Palm Sunday, so we're so happy to sing Hosanna, to welcome our King and to praise Him for who He is. So if you'd like, let's stand and let's praise Him. Thank you. 
Good morning, Crossroads. Thank you, Ben, for this rousing wake up. And we are here to welcome King Jesus, and I am here to welcome you. I'm so glad to see you here this morning, those of you who came to meet with us in person, and also those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you joined us, and we're glad that you're here with us this Sunday morning. We've been singing about welcoming the King who comes in the name of the Lord. We know exactly what happens after that. We're looking forward to Good Friday and to Easter. And even if you don't know exactly what this whole church thing is about, you're not exactly sure why you're here, what kind of King, what kind of rescue you're looking for, we're glad you're here. And I pray that you'll find uh, a little bit more insight, a little bit more light on your way as you worship with us this morning. My name is Allison. I'm one of the elders here. Um, we're glad to welcome new people into our community. If you're new and you don't know anyone, please sort of make sure that someone knows that you're new in a room this size. We don't always know who's new and who's been coming for a while. And you can also go to the Connect Point in the lobby after the service if you'd like some more information about Crossroads and how to get connected. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can check our website or the church app for the same information. And now let's watch the announcements together. Good morning, Crossroads. It's great having you today with us in the service. We're looking forward to what the sermon will bring, and hopefully it would be a great blessing for you. Just a few announcements for the upcoming weeks. As you know, next week, the 29th of March, would be our um, Good Friday service here at the RSA. Everybody is invited, and uh, we're looking forward to a very blessed sermon that day as well. The next uh, announcement, quite important. Maybe you're wondering about whether you want to become a member of our church. It's our privilege to start the Take Root course for new members on the 15th of April. And here you'll be learning everything about our church, what we believe, how we do things, where you can get involved and just become part of our community. So you can register on our app under the events at Take Root. I hope to see you there because I'm hosting it. So it would be great to meet all of you. And then lastly, our men's ministry will be hosting an evening for the men about communication and understanding and listening in marriages. So maybe you're sitting here, men, and you, you know as well as I do that we sometimes do not listen as, as well as we should. I would like to invite you to this evening on the 4th of April. We'll be talking about how to properly communicate in, in your marriage and how to understand your wife, which might take longer than an evening, but I'm sure we'll make it. After that evening, that you have a clearer understanding of who your wife really is and how to understand her. So it's for all men, anyone, 18 plus, maybe you're not even married and you already don't understand women. This is the time to come and understand something more about women. I hope to see you there on that evening on the 4th of April. You can register on our app once again. Enjoy the service and... I hope to see you after the service for a coffee. Bye. <laughs> That's great. Bye. That is so funny. Okay, well, after that, <laughs> we're going to stand and we're going to sing about the beautiful name of Jesus.
Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater.
Jesus, you are worthy. You're worthy of our praise. If you want to sing Hosanna, we want to praise you for your name, praise you for who you are, Lord. Yes, Lord, we thank you that we can come to the altar, that we can sit at your throne.
Lord, thank you. Thank you for the work at the cross. Thank you that you're standing there, arms open wide to receive us. Lord, I pray that you would be here today. I especially pray for those who who don't know if they should come forward. and, and, And if you're actually standing there, arms open wide, I pray, Lord, that today you would talk to them. And that for all of us, Lord, you would you would come with your spirit and, and minister to us and show us who you are and how much and how deep you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Palm Sunday. And we're in the middle of a series called Words of Life. Words that Jesus spoke that gave life, that still give life. And a few weeks ago, Paul talked to us about the words Jesus spoke about the the kingdom of God, something he spoke about a lot. And then Anna took us and and, and we looked at the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And then last week, Paul looked at the parables. And today, today is Palm Sunday. And we remember that Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and, and People hailed him in as king and as Messiah, and they took palm branches and they they put it in front of him on the road, making a carpet for him to ride on into Jerusalem. And the night before he actually rode in, he spent time and he spent the evening with his friends in a little village outside of Jerusalem, with Mary, with Martha, and with Lazarus. Remember Lazarus? Lazarus, who was so sick that he was about to die, and Jesus heard of it, and Jesus went to him, but... But when he arrived, he was too late. Already, Lazarus had been buried for four days. And as as Jesus was ministering to his sisters and, and bringing comfort to them, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall not die but live forever. (laughs) And to prove his point, he went to the grave. And he told them to roll away the stone, and he called Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus rose, and Lazarus walked out of the grave, foreshadowing what would happen on Easter, that Jesus himself would rise and walk out of the grave. Death, he commanded death, death had to listen to him. And many put their faith in Jesus that day. And the word spread. And now this evening, he's spending time with his friends, having dinner together, and a large crowd had gathered. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to see Lazarus. They'd become kind of a tourist attraction there. And the next morning, the crowd hailed him in, into Jerusalem, put him on a donkey, and he rode into Jerusalem. And the the Pharisees didn't like it one bit. The religious authorities didn't like it one bit. And Jesus knew full well that he was riding toward his death. He'd been telling his disciples all along that that's why he had to go to Jerusalem. And today, we look at these I am statements of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. That's one of the things he says. So so what's so radical about these statements? And what does it mean for us? The beginning of this year, it was six years ago that my father died. And on his gravestones, there are two dates connected with a little dash. 7th of March... 1932-5th of January 2018. His whole life is represented by this little dash. (laughs) The Bible tells us our lives are but a breath, a fleeting shadow. If you you just imagine how, how old the earth is and how long we get to walk on it, it's just such a short time. It's like a breath on a cold morning. You see it come out of your mouth and it disappears into the air. That's how the Bible speaks about it. And our lives are then for a little while represented by a little dash on a gravestone. Time passes by quickly. And we wish for this dash to be longer or maybe to even go on forever. And we're longing to escape the limitations of being finite, of having a beginning and an end. People, when they go to prison, speak about doing time. Well, we're all doing time. (laughs) Time is like a prison, right? We're born, we live, we die in this confined space, this little dark room. 
and there's no way out. And we wonder what's outside. Wonder. You know, we, we, we dream about the great outdoors, the outside world. And we, we long for time to be longer. And we don't want just tips on time management. We want to break out. But that would have to be an outside job, right? Nobody from the inside ever broke out. <laughs> and nobody from the outside ever broke in, right? Or have they? <laughs> there are all these I am statements in, in the book of John. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, the life. I'm the shepherd. I'm the vine. You're the branches. And in chapter 8 of John, Jesus then says, Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, before Abram was born, I am. At this, the, they picked up stones, the Pharisees that is, to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. In this case, the I am statement is not followed by a descriptive statement. Jesus doesn't add anything. And the religious authorities, the Pharisees, didn't like it. They wanted to kill him. Now, why is that? In Greek, the words are ego, a me. I am. And when we examine how Jesus uses that phrase, um, we discover that he's d doing much more than making descriptive statements about himself. And we need to go back to the Old Testament to look at the words Jesus spoke to Moses in the burning bush. Remember the stories? The Israelites were in, in Egypt. They were being, being living in slavery, being oppressed. And they cried out to God. And God heard them. And God saw them. And God wanted to do something about it. And, and um, he spoke to Moses from the burning bush. He called Moses to go to the Israelites and tell them that God would come and save them. Come and take them out of Egypt. Come and, and lead them to the promised land. And then Moses asked, but, but who should I say is sending me? Who, what is your name? And then in Exodus 3, we read, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am is the name God reserved for himself. And it's not the only place in the Old Testament where God reserves that, claims that ego and me statement. In Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, God reveals himself once more as the savior of Israel. And this time not to save them for, from, from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, but, but from exile in Babylon. And in these chapters, Isaiah introduces the suffering servant. The Messiah who will redeem and, and who will restore his people. And ultimately bring justice to earth. And repeatedly God emphasizes there his own uniqueness and his own supremacy. With an ego, a me statement. Regularly translated as I am he. Now there's several of these verses there. And I've just picked two of them. Let's, let's look at them. Isaiah 43. I am. Even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. Isaiah 48, listen to me, Jacob, Israel whom I've called, I am he. I'm the first and I'm the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens and when I summon them, they all stand up together. These verses show God's relationship to his people, what he accomplished. God is the one who's everlasting. God is the creator. God is the one who forgives your sins. God is the only one. No other gods. I am he. I am he is to be understood to refer to God himself. And now Jesus is applying it to himself. And at that moment, from that moment on, the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Don't get, wanted to get rid of him. But what if it's true? <laughs> if anybody claims or says he is God, you would expect that, you know, there's something wrong with him, right? 
Um, years ago, when I worked as a, an assistant manager in a supermarket, I caught a shoplifter. And as I approached him and I said, hey, hey, what are you doing? He turned to me and says, I am God. <laughs> it took me a little bit of, of guard. And uh, I thought about it a little bit. And then I told him, I said, well, I, I doubt you are. <laughs> Because God himself, in the Eighth Commandment, told us not to steal. So it was pretty clear. That he wasn't who he said he was. But Jesus then asked the Pharisees, can you prove me guilty of sin? And they couldn't. Jesus was sinless. Jesus is not a shoplifter. So that, that doesn't disprove his claim. And he also seemed to be of sound mind, right? He didn't belong in a mental institution. So it's at least reasonable to consider his claim. Now, he might want to back it up a little, right? Give some proof. Well, chapter 9. <laughs> chapter 9 of John has a nice discussion about this. Jesus and his disciples run into this man born blind. And Jesus put mud on his eyes and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now let's back up a little here. We just saw Jesus saying, before Abraham was born, I am. That statement is bookended by Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. In John 8, verse 12, he says it. And in John 9, verse 5, he says it. And when you read carefully, you see that he made that statement, um, that it all took place at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles... During that feast, the city of Jerusalem was flooded with light from four big lampstands. They were positioned inside the temple in the court of women. Lights on poles 21 meters high. <laughs> the priests had to climb ladders to light them. Each, each light consisting of four golden bowls filled with oil. Now you need to remember that, you know, at the time, the cities didn't have public lighting, right? When it got dark at night, it got dark. So this once-a-year festival was an impressive sight. Light from the lampstands was so bright that it was said to have lit up every courtyard in Jerusalem. The lamps were to remind the people of the pillar of fire which, which accompanied the, the, the people of Israel in the desert. God himself, who saved them out of Egypt, out of slavery, had come to dwell among them in the desert, in the wilderness, and he was visible to them in a column of smoke during the day, in a column of fire during the night. Protecting them, guiding them, providing for them, reminding them that it was God who saved them out of Egypt and it was leading them into the promised land. And it was against that background that Jesus made this, his first declaration in John 8 verse 12. That he was the light of the world. Not just a light that lights up Jerusalem. No, a light that lights up the world. And he connected that light with life. Let's read in John 8. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And now here we are in chapter 9. And Jesus engages with this man born blind. And he repeats the statement... As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus here is claiming equality with God. Equality with the God that saved the people of Israel out of Egypt. See that light that's lighting up Jerusalem? Remember how God showed himself in the desert, in the pillar of light in the, in the wilderness? I am that light. I am he. With me, there is also salvation. I'm also here to lead you out of slavery, to help you break out of that little room in time, to prolong your dash. And to back up his claim then, of being the light, of being the I am, he heals this blind man. He tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is then a nice, nice reference again to the Feast of Tabernacles. There's so much symbolism here. At this feast, the, the priest would draw water from that same pool. 
And after he had drawn the water, he would go in procession with people following him, uh, maybe a choir or whatever, and they were all chanting this verse for, from Isaiah 12, verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. And then when they reached the temple, he would, would pour the water over the altar. And as he does this, there's these images and, and, and these He's reminded of statements from, from, from other prophets, from the prophet Zechariah and Ezekiel, who had visions of, of rivers flowing from, from the temple. In an uh, astonishing display of God's blessing. And all these images were present in this ceremony. And it's, it's then that Jesus calls out, if anyone is thirsty, come to me. In other words, come and drink from the waters of salvation. And in that pool, this blind man is now to wash himself. In the place where the water of salvation was drawn. And this man was healed. And he wasn't just healed, he was changed. If you read the passage, you see his neighbors discussing, is this the same guy? Do you think it's really him? Jesus healed the man. He claimed, I am the light of the world, and he, he gave this man lied in his eyes as he washed himself in the well of salvation. That's how Jesus backs up his claim. That I am he. No one else but God can do that. And it's interesting then to see the contrast between the, the, this discussion between the, the Pharisees and this man. The Pharisees who know the Bibles really well. Who, uh, who know all the rules. They think Jesus is not from God because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And God told us not to work on the Sabbath. So he must be a sinner. And they turn to the man, what do you think? And the man says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. As far as I'm concerned, he is from God. Because who else but God can heal? And it stops me to think, do I think I know all the answers? Do I think I have God figured out? Or is there room for Jesus to show up and do something miraculous? To blow my mind. <laughs> to reinterpret the law. Because if he's the I am, he can do that, right? He can shine his light on how he, and tell us how he thinks the law should be interpreted and, and applied. Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous or those who think they're righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. Or as in the end of chapter 9, Jesus said, for judgment I've come into the world so that the blind will see and those who will see become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, the guilt remains. Why do I think I can see? Am I a religious person? Do I think I know better than others? Or do maybe even am better than others? Do I look at people and think, oh, they are, they're so narrow-minded? Or maybe the opposite, they're so liberal. <laughs> Have I divided the world up in two camps? Those who think like me, and I think I think like God, of course, and those who go to hell. You know, most of us have a form of religious thinking. We divide up in the world and those we think are good and those who think we're are bad. And we, of course, belong to the ones that are good. <laughs> Something to think about. But Jesus says, I am he. <laughs> what if it's true? If someone from outside time, if the God who was and is and is to come, who... who who is always have been and who always will be, who has no beginning, who has no end, who is the Alpha and the Omega, who is from outside time. If this great and holy and awesome God who's sitting high enthroned in the heavens. The Bible says the earth is just his footstool. He's so big, the earth cannot contain him. To think that that holy God that I can even not even look at, because if I would just... 
cleanse at him. I would die because he's holy and I'm not. That that God would even think of me. That that God would even love me. That he came down to earth. He broke into time to walk among us. As a human being, mis being misunderstood, being mistreated, being murdered on the cross. He prov he, he, he broke into time to provide a way for us, to open a door, to let light in, to give us life. He, he promises to take this short little dash of ours and make it go on forever if we just believe in Him. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me, follow me, he says. We're being called. We're being called into something much bigger. A great adventure. If you really believe, Jesus says, that I am, I am, that I am he. The first and the last, the holy God, follow me. When we encounter that Jesus, the I am, we realize that we're standing on holy ground. And there's only one proper response like Moses had at the burning bush. He would take off his shoes and realize he's standing on holy ground. And we, we worship Jesus. And what does he do? He stoops down and he washes our feet. The great I am washes our feet. Mind-blowing. John 13. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Do you understand what I've done for you? Jesus asked. Do you understand that I am He? And I am washing your feet. When we look at Jesus, we see God Almighty. I and the Father are one, Jesus says in John 10. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you know me, you know my Father, Jesus says in John 8. If you want to know God, look at Jesus. Look what He cares about. Look who He cares about. Look what he does. Look at his heart. Do you understand? The truth is not about a bunch of statements that we need to learn. It's not about a set of rules to follow. Look at Jesus. He is the truth. Now that can be rather upsetting to the status quo. <laughs> because we seem to have a need to divide and to determine who's in and who's out. And Jesus didn't have such a desire. Or at least, maybe he did, but on very different grounds. He seemed to be very stern with the Pharisees, who knew the Bibles very well, who had a zeal to honor God. But in their zeal, misapplied the law. Following the law had become more important than loving God and loving their neighbors. Jesus, on the other hand, seems to look at the heart. A heart that says, I don't know much, but I know that I was blind and now I see. A heart that worships Jesus and stoops low and washes the feet of others. Jesus doesn't say try harder, but he completely breaks our foundations. He, he smashes our world and our worldview. Our old self has to go. It has to die for us to follow Jesus. 
Now, when we look at these I am statements, what blows me away or what maybe what confuses me is that our relationship with Jesus here, our relationship with the Lord needs to be much more than following. I mean, when we hear Jesus say, I'm the shepherd, we understand. We're sheep, we need to follow, we need to listen to his voice. But he also says, I am the door. He doesn't say, I will show you the door. He says, I am the door. You need to enter through me. And he doesn't say, I will show you the way, and I will show you the truth, and I will give you life. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. What does that mean for us if we want to know the truth? Or have life. We're not just following a great teacher. Our relationship needs to be much, much closer. In John 6, there's another I am statement. Jesus declared himself the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he invites his hearers to actually eat him. And I think it's fitting that so before Easter, we take a close look at this I am statement. John 6, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We just saw that the God who made us is serving us. And he says, do you understand this? Do you understand why I'm doing this? And if you understand, you're blessed. And if you do it yourself, you're blessed. It's one thing to understand this, it's another thing to do it. And after washing their feet, now we don't see this in the book of John, but in all the other Gospels, after washing their feet, he takes bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them. And he takes a cup and he gives it to them to drink. He breaks the bread and says, this is my body, eat it. He takes the the cup and he says, this is my blood, the new covenant in my blood, drink it. And he's explaining to them that this is to be an ongoing sacrament. Whenever we need, that's what we are to do. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about this bread. And he, sa- and he goes, do you understand this bread is a participation in the body of Christ? And this blood is a participation in the blood of Christ. And the word participation is the word koinonia. It means fellowship, partnership, participation, communion. It even is used for for intercourse. (laughs) It's that close, that intimate. The idea of, of the melding together of the flesh and blood of Christ in koinonia, in partnership with our blood and flesh. And somehow mysteriously when we come together as the body of Christ, we're, we're, we're taking the body and we're taking the blood of Christ and something real happens. His, his presence is there with us. Real fellowship. And somehow this act of eating and drinking is an act of faith that through Jesus we are one with Jesus and the Father. That by eating and drinking we're, we're giving up our own lives. We're giving up our need for control. We're giving up for Jesus to be who we, who we want him to be. In this act of eating and drinking and thanking and accepting and submitting to what Jesus did for us, he gave his blood, he gave his body on the cross so we can be saved. And when we believe this, when we accept this, when we internalize this in this physical act of eating and drinking, Becoming one with him in that act, we will have life. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. It would be nice to have communion now. But I'm going to let you hanging there. Think about it. Ponder it. Meditate on it this week and come back Friday. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus is the great I am. And he's riding into Jerusalem toward his death. And he says, follow me. Be one with me. Be one with I am. And he was killed by those who claimed they could see. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And it's through me that you can see. 
I will lead you to salvation. But you need to give up your old self. You need to completely identify with me. You need to die before you can have life. <laughs> so come right into Jerusalem with me. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the almighty I am. We're blown away that you would break into time and offer us life, eternal life. That you, the great I am, stoop down to wash our feet, to serve us. We're blown away by, by your offer to become one with you. Lord, as we approach Easter weekend, this Holy Week, help us to remember you. To look at our lives and to give up every area to you. To let go of what we're holding on to. To let it get nailed to the cross with you. So we give up our lives, Lord, so we can be raised with you to eternal life on Easter morning. Lord, we can never thank you enough. I just don't have the words. Work with your spirit in us to know and to understand and to grasp how high and how wide and how deep your great love is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. you bore so I could live in the free 
worthy is the name of Jesus. The Lord saves. Uh, we're going to continue our worship now by collecting the offering. If you're a member or a regular attender, uh, we encourage you to be generous, and we thank you for your generosity in giving and to support the mission of Crossroads, the building, the staff, our contributions to missions. It's all funded by your gifts. So thank you for, uh, for your generous and um, regular giving. And of course, if you're a guest, then please don't feel obligated to participate. I'm going to lead us uh, in prayer in a moment. If you would like to pray with someone after the service, there will be a prayer team here at the front. So please uh, come forward if you'd like someone to pray with you. And after I've prayed, we'll say the prayer of blessing together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good word this morning. Thank you for being present among us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking your words of love to us through Jesus, through Johan's uh, words this morning. Father, I pray that uh, the words that you have for each of us will take root in our hearts. I pray that if any of us have been um, too focused on rules and regulations, if we have judged others, that you will forgive us. Father, I pray that each of us will hear the voice of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, that these words of life will bring life to our hearts and, and flow out from us, even as the prophet's vision of the waters flowing out from the temple filled the whole earth with your life. God, let your life go with us and spill out into the people around us this week. And I pray that we may indeed continue to reflect on and feed on you as we look forward to Easter to Good Friday and then to Easter. God, will your spirit continue to remind us of these words and of the love that you have for us. Father, we thank you for the gifts that our community has brought, not only the finances, Father, but those who've made this service possible, the worship team and all those who are serving in the background in the children's ministry, um, those who've come to hear your word. Thank you for your rich generosity towards us. In the name of Jesus. Now, if you uh, would take hands with the people around you, we're going to pray the blessing over each other. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Go in peace.